Welcome to The Access. I'm your host, Havi Buzo. In this episode, we'll be discussing President Trump's major speech on Iran's strategy, U.S. policy on Syria and Assad, the war on ISIS, and the overall strategy in the war on terror. To talk about all this, we are joined by General Jack Keane, retired four-star general, former vice chief of staff of the U.S. Army, and the chairman of the Institute for the Study of War. Thank you so much for joining us today, General Jack Keen. I'm very honored to have you on my show. Delighted to be here. I want to start by talking about your career as a, a general. You are a four-star general. You've been offered by the current administration to become the Secretary of Defense, and you declined. Can we hear a little bit more about you know, your career, and why did you decline becoming as Secretary of Defense of the United States. Well, yes, I'm, a, I, I'm an infantry paratrooper, airborne ranger, we call it. Um, spent all my life uh, in infantry units. Um, I grew up in New York City, attended a Jesuit university there. Nobody in my family had ever made a career out of the military, and I was a first-generation college student. So my father was a World War II Marine, and, and he was a working-class guy. And, uh, but nonetheless, uh, I thought I had an aptitude for the military, and, and I joined it with uh, my wife, Terry, who I'd been married to for one year, my last year in college. And we stayed for almost uh, 40 years. Never expected to be a general, to be honest about it, but I was promoted, and I kept getting promoted. <laughs> and uh, I loved all of it. I truly loved it. Um, I commanded an Army Division, 101st Airborne Division, 18th Airborne Corps. Uh, has all the paratroopers in it and three other divisions. It's our largest war fighting organization. And I got the opportunity to run the Army day in and day out for about four and a half years. So it, it, was, a, it was a remarkable experience. I was honored to represent the United States many, many times overseas um, and certainly honored to represent the, uh, the great soldiers that we have. You, you know, became a four-star general. Not many generals make it to becoming four-star generals. And then you were, you know, offered to be the Secretary of Defense, chosen yeah. by the president. What happened there? Well, as I told him uh, to his face, uh, <clears throat> my wife had passed away recently, and we had been married for 51 years. We've been with each other for 55 years since we were 18. Sorry to hear and, that. And uh, so... Um, I wasn't uh, emotionally nor financially, I was just honest with him, in a position uh, because she had been uh, so sick for a long time, she needed 24-7 care and a lot of other things uh, for the last four years of her life, that I just wasn't in a position to be able to do it. He was very uh, empathetic of it. Uh, well, he had asked me, how long were you married? And I told him, he leaned back in the chair and he said, uh, oh my God, uh, you are really going through something. And I said, yeah, I am. So, but he, he was very understanding and supportive and he asked me to, to talk to him about the challenges the United States is facing. And, and then he said, if it's not you, then who? And mm -hmm. I recommended uh, General Jim Mattis. You know? Exactly, and that's who we had. That's correct. Um, you are close to the, you know, General Mattis mm -hmm. and uh, General McMaster. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you've seen a transition on where the United States was during the George W. Bush time, even before, and then what happened during the Obama administration, and then where we are today. Can you tell us a bit about your impression of the transition of the United States as a world power, as a world leader, and are we still in the same position now? Well, first of all, uh, the eight years under the Obama administration, uh, I, I certainly wanted uh, President Obama to succeed as an American president. Um, but clearly, he made some just horrible assumptions. To give you an example, he made an assumption that the United States could disengage from the Middle East and we could still contain radical Islam. Actually, it exploded and we got ISIS. He, he, he made another decision that we could reset our policies with Russia, give up missiles in Eastern Europe, Europe, and somehow we would have a more stable relationship with Russia. We got Crimea, Eastern Ukraine, and military intervention into Syria. 
He also, that's something I'm sure we're going to talk about, he wanted to achieve a nuclear agreement with the Iranians. And he thought that that would be an incentive for the Iranians to join the community of responsible nations. And what we got out of that was Iran's increased aggressive and assertive malign behavior in the region, trampling over our allies in the region and the United States. And he also further said that by pushing some capabilities out into the Far East and the Pacific, that somehow that would contain China's ambitions. And what we really got is China has revised the order in the Pacific to their favor at, to the disadvantage of the United States and our allies. What Trump has done, I think, is something I wasn't sure he was going to do, but he has done it. He has returned the United States to the world stage as a global leader, promoting peace, prosperity, and security. And in, in consonance with that, he's reassured our allies in the Far East and the Middle East and Europe that he's got their back and that the United States will stand with them. And then the second thing he's done, and I'm sure we'll talk about it, is he is willing to confront his adversaries in a way that President Obama never was. And I think President Obama was paralyzed by the fear of adverse consequence. And Trump recognizes, I think instinctively, even though he hasn't been a member of the political class, that you have to stand up to the bullies of the world. And there's real bullies out there in Iran, in North Korea, in Russia, to a lesser degree in China, but nonetheless very aggressive. You have to stand up to them. And sometimes the way to avoid a fight is you've got to be willing to get into one. And Trump just instinctively understands that, and then he shapes policies around it. The United States, according to some people, um, is still trying to, you know, get that credibility, that leadership role that you, you've uh, mentioned uh, that we've lost in the last eight years. Um, with, the, with what we're seeing today, uh, we heard President Trump give a speech about Iran, and we uh, are seeing a new strategy, perhaps, to counter Iran, uh, one of the biggest, uh, you know, supporters of extremism, uh, you know, this uh, disability in the region, uh, many things that have happened uh, since the empowerment of Iran because of the nuclear deal and because of the, you know, turning a blind eye on its action. Was that speech up to the level of your expectations? What was, you know, uh, what were you happy about in the speech, and what were you hoping to hear that you didn't hear today? Well, first of all, um, you know, my, my contribution to national security now is more as a strategist and to a lesser degree as a military person, but I, I can never give up my knowledge of the United States military. But when I look at that speech, what I, what I loved about it is he, 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 they spent four months trying to figure out what to do with Iran, and they've come up. Uh, with a review of that, and, I, and they've taken their strategic view. And everybody's going to focus on, you know, decertifying the nuclear deal. But the, the reality is they, they have broken with the Obama administration and the policy of appeasement that we had for eight years with Iran. They have formally broken that and said, uh, strategically, Iran's malign and assertive behavior in the region is not in the interest of the United States nor of our allies. And we are going to stand with our allies and confront the Iranians' behavior. And that is trampling on Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, using proxies, using terrorism, developing ballistic missiles, uh, obviously on a path because of the nuclear deal to developing nuclear weapons, using the Revolutionary Guard and the Quds Force to be the executors of their malign policy. Uh, so what I think is what the Trump contribution they made today is they've taken a strategic view of Iran. They've absolutely reversed the role that the United States has had in the past of appeasement, and they're going to confront the Iranians. Mm -hmm. And this has got to be welcome news, particularly for our allies who live in the region. Um, we, we know that uh, there was some back and forth last week between uh, President Trump and Rex Tillerson. We know that there is 
or we hear that there are some uh, disagreements, let's say, uh, between basically two ways of thinking about the region and the world in general. Uh, you know, I've met people in the White House and Im immediately they said, if you want to recommend something, you need to talk to General uh, Keen about it. So you're very close to people in the White House today. What, what is happening in between, you know, Secretary Tillerson, McMaster, and the President? Yeah. Well, let me first say that with most of the presidents that I'm aware of and dealing with the tough global challenges that the United States presidents have always had to deal with, you know, post-World War II at least, um, to get consensus and total agreement on every one of those challenges all the time is virtually impossible. These are tough, complicated issues, and a president should get differing views. It, it, it's good government for some of his advisors not to agree with each other, or maybe at times not to agree with him. Mm -hmm. And I told him uh, when he was asking me about the world out there uh, in that interview with him, I told him, don't apologize for not being an expert at it. This is not your background, nor is it the background of most people who become president of the United States. Mm -hmm. They grew up in a political class and focused on domestic issues, not international issues. I said, we've only had a few presidents who really were masters of international challenges. So here we have here, and the, what happens with the media is really overblown. In, in America, your audience should understand, if there's a sl slightest di disagreement with the president, the media focuses on it and makes it a bigger story than what it is. Mm -hmm. So I know for a fact that President Trump, Tillerson, Mattis, Gen General Mattis, Secretary Tillerson, and the National Security Advisor, General McMasters, and the director of the CIA, Pompeo, they all agree that we should stay, at least for the time being, in the nuclear deal. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, let's see if the Congress of the United States and our allies who are signatories to the deal are willing to make some amendments to the deal. We do not like it. Yes. In its current form. So they're going to take some time to see if we can amend it or fix it. And I'm confident if that doesn't happen, if some changes aren't made, for whatever the reason, mm -hmm. the Allies can't do it, the Congress cannot agree, and we've seen plenty of evidence where the American Congress doesn't agree on things, mm -hmm. uh, then I believe what will happen is the national security team around the president will come to him and recommend to him that we terminate our association with that deal. In your opinion, until the Congress decides on anything, now knowing that the president is going to turn the deal into the Congress, mm -hmm. treat it, or make it into a treaty, turn it into the Congress, would uh, the deal actually still be in place and the sanctions will continue to be lifted until we find a decision? I, I don't, yes. I don't think they'll impose any sanctions. Um, on Iran. If they did that, that would kill the deal. So mm -hmm. what they're going to do, they have 60 days before they have to act in any event. Mm -hmm. Remember, this is, a, this is a piece, so our audience understands, this is a piece of U.S. congressional legislation that was, that was passed prior to the nuclear deal becoming an agreement mm -hmm. because the United States Congress, largely Republicans at the time and still are, were concerned about the deal. They didn't like the direction it was taken, and they were skeptical about the execution of it. So that is why they asked the American president, whoever that was going to be, Democrat or Republican, to certify every 90 days that, you're in co that Iran is in compliance. Mm -hmm. So what I think uh, the president will do, he'll see if the Congress and our allies are willing to make some amendments. Even if the Congress makes some fixes legislatively, for that to impact on the deal, the nuclear agreement, the so-called JCPOA, our allies would have to agree to that as well who signed it. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is easy to talk about, but this is really going to be hard. But here's some of the things they're looking at changing. Mm -hmm. They want better enforcement. Mm -hmm. For example, the, the Iranians are not letting us see, get at any of their military sites. And we know in the past it was at those military sites that they covertly were developing nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. So in the deal, though, the wording in the deal says 
there has to be tangible, probable cause that there's something happening at those nuclear sites. In other uh -huh. words, well, that's if you can't inspect the site and you can't view it, it's then very difficult you know? to get probable cause. Exactly. So they want enforcement is we want to have some access to those nuclear sites. Exactly. So that's one change we'd like to make. Another change is it doesn't make any sense to let Iran to continue to develop ballistic missiles that you can put nuclear weapons on. And that's what the purpose of those are, particularly intercontinental ballistic missiles which could reach Europe and the United States. We want to include that in the deal. It should have been in the agreement to, in the first place, but we want to put that in there. So those are a, a couple of things that the Congress will try to shape and also the Trump administration, Secretary Tillerson, will have to talk to our allies about as that, As those agreements are made in the Congress, we'll have to take that and see if we can convince France the, yes. and the United Kingdom and Germany mm -hmm. and Russia and China to agree to all of that, which will be quite a challenge. Yeah, I mean, especially that, you know, now we're, we're saying, you know, uh, Iran is not, like, it is complying with the nuclear deal, but the deal itself is weak and it's not very clear and there's so many holes in it. Um, we've been hearing some, you know, positions uh, or statements by France. They obviously don't want to, uh, uh, they don't want to cancel the deal. They want to keep it. But at the same time, they are willing to try to pressure Iran on other issues. Um, and in particular, um, the action of Iran in the region. This is, I think, something that a lot of people agree on, not Russia and China, but everybody else, perhaps, um, where we, you know, people were hoping that you know what, even the nuclear deal is not our biggest issue. It's Iran's action in the region. Mm. Do you uh, see that France, the United Kingdom, and other uh, American partners working on the deal, or, you know, Germany, of course, uh, other uh, partners in the region, is that, is the speech today addressed those yeah, concerns? Yeah, the speech does address it because <laughs> I think the number one, remember the first thing he said in the speech in terms of their strategic objectives was to, to stop Iran's malign behavior in the, in the region mm -hmm. and, and their aggressive assertive behavior along with that. So I, I definitely think there's a potential for some common ground with our allies on that behavior, on, on ballistic missiles. And, the, uh, and, and maybe that will be done separately from the nuclear deal. I, mm -hmm. I don't, I'm just supposing. Yes. We already know that the president has said this. He, he's sanctioning the Re Revolutionary Guards. The Quds Force, as you know, is a part of that. And they have been, they have been sanctioned and declared a terrorist organization. He's doing the very same thing with the Revolutionary Guards. And he wants to stop them from, from having, he wants to sh shut down their funding mm -hmm. and he wants to sanction them. So that is probably going to get a reaction from the Iranians. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that reaction will also maybe help us with our allies. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and maybe they're being willing to go, to go further. I think the Iranians um, are likely, as a result of that policy, dealing with the Revolutionary Guards, are, are likely, and they're threatening this, and, and mm -hmm. I think they probably will, will do it it is likely that they'll use their proxies in Iraq and also possibly in Syria to attack U.S. troops and U.S. bases, mm -hmm. as they have done in the past in, in As Iraq. a retaliation in for retaliation. the IRGC in, in Retaliation sanctions. for sanctioning the IRGC and calling them a terrorist organization. I want to go a little bit more in, in depth on this issue because people were hoping that it's going to be designated as a terrorist organization. Um, as if what that was part of originally that was like a decision that should have been implemented before and never has been um, w and today we heard that it was a on blacklist so it was like blacklisting the IRGC w what is the difference between putting or designating I'm not sure them as a terrorist a, organization I'm not sure there's a distinction that's that's worth the difference you know mm -hmm. I mean I'm just not sure I mean he's He's called them a terrorist organization. He's listing them as such. Mm -hmm. He's going to sanction them. Um, I so know we are have, they designated. We have today? multiple lists 
um, in the United States government. It can be a little confusing even for those of us who are close to it um, in, in terms of how we designate people on terrorist lists. I've been confused about it myself one time. I had to ask General Petraeus, who was a director of the CIA, to help me understand why we have, why do we have different lists? Mm -hmm. it, it's very confusing. I don't know what list the IRGC is on now, to be mm -hmm. frank about it, I, because it was the vague. The president didn't allow any questions, you mm -hmm. know, so that'll get answered by some some of his people. Mm -hmm. But there's no doubt he's called out the Revolutionary Guards. There's no doubt he's sanctioning them. There's no mm -hmm. doubt he's he's declared them a terrorist organization. I think we'll get some pushback from the Iranians over that, which mm -hmm. may help in the long run, you know, dealing with Iran and, and our allies. There were, there were some rumors that the White House or some people in the White House were hoping that Iran would pull itself out of the nuclear deal as a retaliation that, you know what, we are done with this and we're going to leave. But we actually heard that Iran was even more, um, you know, interested in keeping the deal than anything, especially when they were afraid that, you know, uh, they will, the whole deal will be canceled. Do you think Iran will eventually say we are done with the deal and walk away? No, I don't think they will because it, it's so much in their favor. You know, they got a windfall of money up front, which is an absurdity in itself. The money should have been, as the president said today, the money should have been at the back end after you had some assurances they were conforming, not at the front end. There's still more money coming. The um, If they pull out of the deal, one of the problems that they're going to encounter is it, it, it opens up the opportunity to sanction them some more and start moving back to where we were with them before the deal was agreed to. And they, those sanctions were having some significant economic impact on them. Plus, as you know, as a result of the lifting of the sanctions, um, many countries in Europe and also to a lesser degree in the Middle East, are now doing business with Iran in a way that they were not able to do with it in, in the past. And mm -hmm. they do not want, to include the United States, mm -hmm. by the way, we're selling a massive amount of uh, Boeing airplanes, mm -hmm. which is a major manufacturer in the United States. So yes, they would not want to stop walking all of that back because it's in their economic interest. And also, I think the, the deal and, and maybe American people and some people in the region wouldn't appreciate it, but if you look at it from the Iranian perspective, entering into an agreement with the United States, the United Kingdom, France, Germany, Russia, and China gives them a legitimacy that they did not have before, gives them a legitimacy in front of their own people, many of whom think Iran is a terror organization, it's a repressive regime, they want them to go away, they're trampling on their values and, and, and their own interest of what they're trying to do you know, for, their, for their own children and everything inside that country. Yeah. So yes, that, if they walk away, that legitimacy starts to go away. So exactly. I, I don't see the Iranians walking away. One last point about this particular issue with the nuclear deal. If, let's say, the um, Congress decided to put more sanctions again on Iran, mm -hmm. what will happen to that, the deal? That because will kill the deal. That would kill it, even if it, the United States by itself decided to do Because the reason this. for that is, and this is complicated, but the reason, if the, if the United States imposes sanctions on Iran, the United States is in violation of the nuclear mm -hmm. agreement. Yes. So I think it's unlikely that the Congress of the United States will do that. What they will try to do is fix and amend the deal mm -hmm. with not imposing any additional sanctions on it. But if the, if the deal blows up as a result of it, then Clearly, there will be some sanctions on Iran that are not there now. And we probably will be able to get some other countries to work with us on that as well. And we heard also about Hezbollah, that Hezbollah, you know, the White House wanted to mobilize an international effort to, you know, counter Hezbollah's terrorist action in the region. How would we see this on the ground? How would that translate on the ground? Is there a policy 
to really deal with the, all of the Iranian proxy militias, extremist Shiite militias fighting in, in the regional well, the, the administration, areas. Yes. <laughs> the administration only defined their intent. They didn't give us any hint at implementation. But the Hezbollah is the number one major proxy that the Iranians use. Uh, they have been using them to kill Americans going all the way back to when they formed the Islamic State in 1980. In the early 80s, they, using the Hezbollah, they blew up the U.S. Embassy in Lebanon, U.S. Embassy Annex in Lebanon when we moved there. They blew up our Marine barracks. This is hundreds of people being killed. They blew up the U.S. Kuwaiti Embassy. They blew up uh, Air Force barracks in Saudi Arabia. So the Hezbollah has been heavily involved in killing Americans and others, uh, you know, for, for years. Right now, they are a paramilitary organization that has political control of Lebanon. And, that's, yes. th and this is the truth of it. This is a paramilitary terrorist organization that has political control of a nation state. Iran has supplied them, and this is something our audience should understand. Iran, every single year, gives them more modernized rockets and missiles and more missiles. So now they're up to a staggering 160,000 rockets and missiles as we're sitting here in, in Lebanon. Lebanon and multiple bases in Lebanon today. And those missiles are there largely at some point to trample on Israel in, in the region or to execute their interests other places in the region. But that's that's the primary purpose. Secondary purpose would be uh, Sunni Arabs, but primary purpose is, is mm -hmm. Israel. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's the Hezbollah that is the primary ground force in Syria, mm -hmm. not the Syrian army. That's, they have that's... tens of thousands of them in there. The, the Iranian generals run the war in Syria. They, uh, the Syrian generals respond to their orders. There's been a number of Revolutionary Guard generals killed in Syria on the ground. The Russians respond to the Iranian orders. They do s some independent air operations, but most of their operations are conducted in support of ground operations. Hezbollah is the main arm of the Iranians in terms of proxies. Mm -hmm. And yes, it, ha it has to be stopped. Um, in Syria, when we talk about Syria, like you just mentioned, uh, Iran is the main player on the ground using Hezbollah and other proxy militias, um, <clears throat> empowering extremism. I mean, they even shipped, uh, they had a convoy of, uh, of uh, ISIS fighters who were protected by them to go from Lebanon all the way to their resort. Yeah, and they were asking true. the world to, to help them and protect them. Um, <clears throat> is there a policy by the current administration to counter Iran in Syria? And uh, let's, you know, before we talk about Assad himself. Yeah. This is, uh, you put your finger, and it's a great question, you put your finger on, I think, the, the biggest weakness of the Trump administration's policy. They, they, their policy is to destroy the caliphate of ISIS by retaking territory in Iraq, which they've done very successfully and also by destroying rocker and environs around it. And you mentioned Irizor. They eventually will move down the Euphrates River Valley. I think our audience is familiar with what we're talking about, into southeastern Syria and clean out ISIS. However, there is no policy to do this. Um, it, it's what what the Russians and the Iranians have been able to do in western Syria is reverse the gains that the opposition forces had made, stabilize, relatively stabilize western Syria, and assure that Assad is going to stay in power. There is no political solution that will change what I just said. Mm -hmm. That is what Iranian and Russian intervention have successfully done because the United States and our allies did not intervene on behalf of the Syrian people. It's mm -hmm. that simple. Yes. So we cannot reverse that. Mm -hmm. But what we can do is the Iranians are moving east mm -hmm. to take control of eastern Syria. 
and that will be the entire Euphrates River Valley as it goes all the way to Iraq. There is no current strategy to stop that from happening, mm -hmm. and that is a huge strategic mistake on the part of the United States. Mm -hmm. We are focused exclusively on ISIS. on ISIS and not on the larger strategic issue, which is Iran's complete domination of Syria so that they can build the land bridge from Iran through Iraq, through Syria, to Lebanon, establish a base, a Navy base, likely in, in Lebanon. This mm -hmm. is a huge strategic issue for the Iranians, as referred to as the Shia Crescent, mm -hmm. that they want to establish. The United States has it in its wherewithal with Sunni Arabs in the region to roll that back, but we don't have a policy to do it yet, and, and that's, that is tragic. I mean, you know, you definitely talked about one of the most important points. I've talked on my show many times about General McMaster, General Mattis. You know, they know. They've worked in Iraq. Even if you talk about, you know, actually defeating ISIS, how can you defeat ISIS if you're not supporting the Arab Sunnis? Mm -hmm. If they're, you know, being, uh, you know, occupied by even Kurdish, uh, if they view them as occupiers by Kurds or Shiite, of course, or anybody who is not, you know, from their own demographical, uh, you know, uh, part of, of, uh, of the country, they're going to view it as an occupier, and that is going to, you know, create the ground to have an ISIS-2 and an ISIS-3 and an ISIS-4. Um, you know General McMaster, you know General Mattis. They know this very well. Why aren't we? And who is shaping this um, kind of lack or, or this, like, gap uh, of policy that is so crucial? To even I, winning I, I, the war on ISIS, which I, they're I, very I, focused on. I can't answer that because, I, you know, I don't ever reveal what people are telling me. Mm -hmm. But I, I can only tell you this. Um, one, the lack of policy is a, mis is a huge strategic mistake. Two, I can only speculate that their reluctance is because they don't want to be embroiled in Syria and be pulled into the Syrian civil war with the Iranians, the Syrians, and the Russians. And I, that, is, that is likely what their reluctance is. Mm -hmm. But, again, you so accurately put your finger on what the issue is. The whole issue is Sunni Arabs. Because if, if the Sunni Arabs continue to be disenfranchised, if the Sunni Arabs have no control, and the Iranians are totally in control, in control with the Hezbollah and all of their proxies, and the, and the Sunni Arabs continue to be repressed in Syria and also in Iraq. After all, what got us ISIS was the repression of the Sunni Arabs and disenfranchising them on the Maliki when they were politically enfranchised, when this thing was working for a while. Mm -hmm. That created the ferment for ISIS to grow. Mm -hmm. And you're absolutely right. There'll be ISIS 2 and 3 or another name. There'll be Sunnis who are politically disenfranchised and feel that their only solution is to take up arms. Mm -hmm. And they'll call themselves something. <laughs> You've met with so many of the United States uh, traditional allies on your travels. What is the number one thing that y you think uh, that worries everybody right now? Uh, especially in the region and even in Europe, that has been shaking uh, the under the one, Obama administration. I've been, I spent three weeks in uh, in Europe. I've been in the Mi Middle East a number of months ago. I've been in the Far East, and the um, the number one issue is Trump. You know, who is he? Where yes. are we going? Mm -hmm. Most of them are encouraged, Although, you know, he's controversial, and he's interesting because he's so controversial, and he speaks, you know, almost daily on all sorts of issues because he's, he tweets, mm -hmm. and he says what's on his mind. If it's right up here, he has a tendency to say it, mm -hmm. where most leaders, you know, hold back those expressions. But he didn't grow up in politics, and he used to speak in his mind. Nobody's going to change him. Mm -hmm. So that's who he is. So there, there's a certain fascination with him. You know, what is he really like? Uh, does he really mean everything he says, et cetera? Mm -hmm. But when you get past that, what people are really interested in is American leadership and American policies 
that come out of that leadership? Are, are, is America really going to stand up for us in the Far East, in the Middle East, and in Europe? Mm -hmm. Are we really going to back the alliances? Does Trump really mean what he says? When he went to the Middle East and there were 55 uh, leaders from the Middle East in Riyadh, and he stood up and said that Iran is the number one strategic threat to the region, and I'm going to stand with you, and we'll stand together against it. Well, those were words. Yes. Now today, he's got a speech that's in support of that. He's got yes. a policy that's in support of it. He also said to them that we need to work together to, just, to uh, deal with Islamic extremism. And he, he gave them some counsel as to what they needed to do in terms of driving it out of their mosques and schools and, and, and the ideology and offering young people an alternative that gives some purpose to their life mm -hmm. as opposed to being radicalized. So I, I think the commitment that President Trump is making in the Far East with standing up to North Korean aggression, in the Middle East to standing up to Iran and to ISIS to be sure, and also his willingness to deal with Russian aggression in, e in Eastern Europe, I think that is very encouraging to the Allies. They'll, they may not agree with him on his personality. Mm -hmm. They may not agree with him on his style, and that's true of a lot of people in America. Mm -hmm. When it comes to policy, foreign policy and supporting our allies, it is so much better than where we've been these last eight years. Once we declare the winning of uh, war on ISIS in Raqqa, the liberation of Raqqa, um, what do you think we're going to see? Is there going to be any other surprises? Because we know the secrecy that the president likes to keep his plans hidden. And people would like to assume sometimes that there are plans, but they are you know, unknown to anybody. Um, we're seeing that Russia right now is uh, you know, doing its own operation and there's Zor against ISIS, but we know how that goes. And we see that there's uh, ISIS uh, fighters who are going to Hama, which is in the, in the west of Syria. Um, the, the type of war that Iran and, and Russia will have against ISIS is not going to be as effective as the coalition war right. and the systematic knowledge and, and uh, advanced weaponry and so on and so forth. Um, are we going to see anything different after the declaration of maybe winning the war on ISIS in its caliphate, in its uh, capital, Raqqa? Well, first of all, I don't think you'll see us declare that we've won a war mm -hmm. because this is an ideology, and even though we should always take their safe havens away from us, I think we waited far too long to take the main safe haven, which was always at Rocker, away from them. They moved in there in 2012. It's 2017. So it's been five years. And I think earlier the Obama administration should have destroyed it as the main effort, not Iraq being a main. Just wait for the the, the Iraqi army to recover from the debacle that they had when ISIS, you know, ran over them, retrain them, recover them, take a couple of years to do that. But we should have devoted all of our efforts in Syria to destroy that caliphate because you started to shut them down. It's very difficult for them to recruit on the Internet. It's very difficult for them to inspire and motivate others. There's been 38 attacks on NATO countries by ISIS, to include the United States as one of those countries. Mm -hmm. And NATO hasn't declared war on ISIS. It's remarkable. NATO's only declared war once, and that was as a result of the 9-11 attack on the United States. And we should have done it here. So yes, after, after Raqqa and ISIS is cleared out of the southeastern part of, of Syria, that doesn't mean that ISIS is going away. Mm -hmm. Their leadership is, is southeast of Deir Azur right now, and they're still on the Internet. They're still doing things. They're still motivating and inspiring people. How involved people. is the United States in, of this The United part. States is very is aggressively, yes. much more so than what we've been in the past, is very aggressively going after their so-called uh, the Internet caliphate, mm -hmm. you know, the virtual caliphate. and and. And we, we've, we've tried in the past, and because they move so much, uh, you know, on the Internet, it, it's difficult. But we've got the best minds and capabilities on this. The techno technicality of, 
technicality of it is beyond my comprehension. Mm -hmm. But all I do know is we got our best people on it, and we're finally starting to have some impact. Mm -hmm. So that that's a very good good thing because you want to, you just don't want to kill and capture the soldiers and I mean their fighters and drive them away. You want to get take their finances away from them, and you want to take their ability to, to at large communicate with the world. But listen, if if there's people. There's a few thousand people that want to belong to ISIS and communicate on the internet and hide and do that. They'll probably be able to do that. But yes, their but impact, not in the way that. But they yeah, were... but the impact will be minimal. Exactly. You know, they'll lose this iconic, almost divinity status that they had for a few years when they were burning people, drowning people, beheading people, doing all of those horrific things, and mm -hmm. seemed to be very successful as a military organization. All of that is going away. There is the elephant of the room, obviously, about Syria, which is Assad. You know, we we hear a lot of things from the administration. Uh, you know, he's a war criminal, so on and so forth. But there is no policy. What do you expect we're going to be seeing, or how things, uh, logically speaking, uh, from where we are today, is going to be moving in Syria? After, uh, you know, maybe things start settling down, Idlib, uh, Turkey is now intervening. We have now only those few cities left. There's Dor, uh, you know, Mayadeen and uh, Bukamal are getting also, you know, there's the fight over them uh, today. But then Assad is, is, to many, is the source of all of this mess that we have, the rise of ISIS, the disfranchise of uh, Sunnis. Um, Nobody is talking about There's no uh, clear um, understanding of what is going to happen to him. Yeah, well, first of all, the Russians and the Iranians have succeeded in propping up the Assad regime successfully. That's happened. The only way Assad will go is if the Russians and the Iranians, particularly the Iranians, want to change him out for another Alawite leader. Mm -hmm. That's Particularly the, the Iranians, not even the Russians. The, the Russians don't the have the power. The Iranians are the decision makers. Not the, the Russians. Not the cannot. Russians. They contribute, but the Iranians motivated Putin. Qasem Soleimani made two visits to Moscow in the spring of 2015 mm -hmm. to motivate Putin to intervene militarily because the opposition forces in northern Syria had taken um, the northern provinces, Idlib, etc., and Aleppo and were moving on the Alawite enclave on the, on the western coast. Mm -hmm. And that was beginning to threaten the existence of the regime. So it was the Iranians that motivated the Russians to come in, and it's the Iranians who are actually in charge. Mm -hmm. So yes, they have succeeded in propping up Assad. That's, that's the, irali the, re the harsh reality by U.S. policy in conjunction with our Sunni Arabs, but the, the Sunnis told us many times, look, if you want to get involved here, we'll get involved with you, but we don't want to get involved without you. Exactly. And Obama said no, and we didn't get involved, and we should have gotten involved. We, we don't know for a fact that the answer would have been different, but it's likely it would have been. But by abdicating totally and just letting the Russians and the Iranians have the field and do what they needed to do, resulted in absolute human catastrophe. We've got over 500,000 people killed as a result of it. We've got millions and millions of people displaced as a result of it. And it's just a, a horrific policy decision made by the United States. It's one that I'm embarrassed even to talk about it, mm -hmm. to think that we could make a policy decision so poorly that would be so harmful uh, to so many people. All that said, I think the Trump policy is not to try to reverse that. Mm -hmm. And and I and I can understand that would mean war, mm -hmm. you know, in western Syria. But what I fundamentally disagree with the Trump policy is they can contain it so it doesn't spread into eastern Syria. That is definitely possible. Mm -hmm. And we would need the cooperation of Sunni Arabs to do that. Even to with cut our own people. the Iranian uh, basically connection between Iraq and yes. Lebanon. Yes, stop them from having a land bridge. Mm -hmm. Between Iraq and Lebanon. They will move tens of thousands of those missiles that are now in Lebanon. They're going to move them into Syria. They'll have them at small little bases in Syria. 
Mm -hmm. And they'll, they'll have them in position to be used against Sunni Arabs and also Israel. And that is going to continue to happen as of now because we're not, we're not sure what the Trump administration is going to do about this. It's not clear to me, and I've talked to them about it. Mm -hmm. It's not clear that there's a policy. It's not clear that there is a policy no. at this point. No. Uh, there is also one question that always lingers about Russia's involvement is the fact that the West is not willing to invest in rebuilding Syria. And Russia is basically struggling financially if you think about it long term. What is the alternative for Russia? How can Russia stay in Syria and, and keep on investing long term from now? Well, there's, you know, problems within Russia. Uh, while there's no money that's going to be paid by anybody? No, that's a good question. The, the Russians really have some challenges. And at times, I think we make them out to be stronger than what they really are. Mm -hmm. First of all, let's look at their military. About two-thirds of it is average at best. They're conscripts, low morale, they don't have the best equipment. One-third of it is very professionalized. One-third. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one-third. And that is what we see. And they've closed the technology gap with the United States, as has China, on precision-guided munitions, you know, like cruise missiles, mm -hmm. long-range rockets, air defense system, electronic warfare, stealth technology, mm -hmm. space-based technology. That, that technology gap that we enjoyed an advantage of after the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 until just about a few years ago, that is closed. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. But there, that's is still that one third of the of the uh, Russian military. They use it very wisely, but it wouldn't be sufficient to fight a major war. Mm -hmm. There's limitations. The second thing, and you put your finger on the biggest problem they have, is their economics. And there are there are country who's who's suffering economically. They've got s significant demographic and health issues, with the largest. HIV population of any industrialized state, the largest respiratory cardiovascular disease problem of any industrialized state, a significant alcoholic problem that they have in their country. I don't, I don't think they're necessarily at the top of it, but nonetheless, it's contributing to a, a much earlier um, age propensity yes. for life than any European country by far. The crime rate is higher now. People are getting yeah, hungry yeah. in Russia. I mean, that's the reports that we're getting. So they've got huge problems. And, and as you're suggesting, that's a burden on them. The longer they stay in Ukraine, it's a burden. The longer they stay in Syria, these are economic burdens on them, much, at, much less take on more. And also, there's casualties that are coming out of this for them, particularly in, in the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't see them, at least in the near term, uh, being any more ambitious than what they already have been. And number two, they're not dealing with Obama anymore. They're mm -hmm. dealing with Trump. Mm -hmm. And Trump and Tillerson and McMasters and Mattis are on to Russian aggression. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to tolerate it when it comes to U.S. interests and those of our allies. Um, my last question is, Israel, because we've been hearing leaks, uh, you know, in the media here and there that there's going to be an Israeli, you know, co confrontation with Hezbollah and Iran, in, in, both in Syria and in Lebanon. Uh, do you see this possibly happening and what the United States position would be if such a war started? It's inevitable that it's going to happen. Um, the Hezbollah and the Hamas do not recognize Israel as a state, and they call for its destruction every single year, as do the Iranians. And the Iranians are feeding them the money and the rockets and the missiles, all the ammunition that they need. So, yes, confrontation with Hezbollah, likely also Hamas, is, is coming. It's, it, it, it is inevitable. The United States has never physically gone to the assistance of the Israelis because they've never asked. Mm -hmm. However, we have provided them Patriot missiles to stand up against, you know, Saddam Hussein's scuds a number of years ago, going all the way back to the early 90s. We've given them some, uh, some missile defense technology 
We've helped them with some cyber defense and, and some other things that we've provided to them. But I don't see the United States having to come to their direct military assistance with the use of our ground forces or with the use of their air power because they, are, they have those capabilities themselves. If they asked the United States for that assistance, if they were in that kind of jeopardy and they asked for that assistance, we would provide it. I want to thank you so much, General Keen, on giving us the time. Glad to be here. Love to have you in the future. You ask great questions. That was it for tonight's episode. Thank you for watching us. Good night.